Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. Neighbor wanted to become an HOA. After a while, my mother gave her such an opportunity, and the whole area hated her. The second story. Assistant manager orders store clothes to keep underage girlfriend's parents from realizing she isn't there. Gets fired and almost arrested. The third story. Boss tells me to only do accounting related tasks at work for my last two weeks. Gets upset when only accounting work is complete. And the first story is... Now you get to be HOA president. About 25 years ago, my parents built their dream house. Although the house is now in the middle of a large metroplex, when they built it was in the fringes of the countryside, with rapid development over two decades. When they bought the lot, they were the first to purchase from the developer. The developer sold to three original neighbors, my parents plus two others, all at the end of the cul-de-sac in a row. The other streets in this plat became a large subdivision with a fancy name that would come to bear a lot of prestige. But that meant being part of an HOA. They didn't want that. The developer wouldn't sell them the land without an HOA. If you aren't part of the community, you'll need to form your own HOA and get it approved. So my dad, with a B-tippet grin, said he would be the HOA president of our single suburban street. He and the two neighbors drafted the bylaws of their own HOA, in strict accordance with the planned neighborhood. But they added a special provision that the president of the HOA could name a successor, instead of having the street vote on one. Absent a majority rejection, the successor would be the president, essentially trying to avoid terms and campaigning, while still offering folks a way to dispute the HOA president, important for later. So in the winter of 1994, my father very seriously took the thick black CD binder full of laminated and hole-punched instructions and pages on how to be a good HOA president, and put that binder in the very back of a cabinet, and forgot about it for the next 16 years. The homeowner of Bizarre Street were not asked to pay an annual fee, and the HOA didn't police number of cars, colors of front doors, or any other ridiculous standards HOA enforced. As it was a quiet cul-de-sac, no one did anything more egregious than the occasional reckless teenager. Then a new family built a house across from us. It consisted of two children, a husband, and an SAHM we'll call Gladys. Kravitz for the Bewitched fans. Now Gladys was a real busybody. She would stand at the front windows of her house to watch or patrol which cars were using the cul-de-sac to turn around when houses down the street held events and parties and were using the front of her house to park for literally a night and sending noise complaints to the police about barking dogs. Her other neighbor's kids. There were six in a blended family. The other neighbor's cars. They were collectors not even repairing cars, and other ridiculously petty things. She didn't have a job, so safety patrol became her whole identity. She would always hurry over to gossip whenever my mom was taking out the trash cans to the curb. Sadly, my dad contracted a neuromuscular disease in 2005. It got bad quickly, and he was confined to a wheelchair. I learned to drive for my hardship license in a handicap van, and we had more than the usual number of cars due to round-the-clock caregivers in the later years. Gladys decided it was time to offer help to my poor mother, who was slaving absurd hours just to keep creditors at bay. Gladys very sweetly approached, expressed her sympathies for our struggles, pointed out the number of cars in our driveway, and generously, so generously, offered to take over the president of the HOA duties if my father would name her successor. After being hounded the sixth or seventh time, and Gladys hinting that if my mom was struggling so much, maybe she could send my dad to hospice and move houses to something more suited. In fact, Gladys' best friend was looking for a house and would love to live across the street and buy our house. My mom effing snapped. She basically told Gladys to stop asking and that her husband was dying and it was incredibly sensitive and rude to offer to kick us out of the neighborhood and take over just because she wanted clout to annoy the neighbors about letting kids play basketball after 6 p.m. Gladys responded nastily that my dad would have to name a successor because when he died soon, the HOA presidency would revert back for election. Okay then, Gladys, you're absolutely right. My dad should name someone the HOA president as his successor after his 16-year reign. Malicious compliance activated. After my dad died, my mom found out she was named as the next HOA president in my dad's will. Dad never said anything about it while he was alive, but his humor was always understated. Gladys was apoplectic. She tried to overturn the successor claim and run against my mom, but nobody else on the street contested the choice. No one, all new neighbors after 20 years, even knew we had a special single street HOA. And for another nine years, my mom did absolutely nothing as HOA president. My mom had to sell the home in 2019 very unwillingly, as it was the house my parents built together.
but with the development of the city, property taxes had risen too high and priced her out. I took a week off work to fly out and help her pack. And while packing up the house, we found my dad's OG 1994 HOA binder, bylaws and all. And of course, mom had to name an HOA successor, so this time she did comply. The malicious part was more against everyone else. Very ceremoniously, haha, <laughs> not. My mom finally named Gladys the presidents of the HOA and gave her the binder, which apparently has long since been digitized and something Gladys had been reading for fun in preparation of this moment. Apparently, Gladys went rabid with power, as her kids had gone off to college and promptly charged everyone on the street $100 a month towards neighborhood incidentals, supposedly for mowing the strip that people just mowed themselves, and a highly encouraged neighborhood barbecue one Saturday a month to address the neighborhood concerns. She also outlawed basketball hoops in driveways, dictated no cars could be parked on the street or in driveways but only in garages, things like landscaping and holiday decor approval, and other inane absurd power trips. My mom kept her next door app open and watched Gladys go down in flames. Three separate households moved and dropped long hate-filled call-out posts about Gladys making their lives a misery until they couldn't stand it anymore. That's three of 12 houses, by the way. Yeah, Gladys wrecked this single street HOA with a quarter loss. Gladys got everything she wanted. My dad to name an HOA successor, my mom to name an HOA successor, for us to move away, and for her to finally be HOA president. And now everyone absolutely hates her, and no one will pay her $100 or go to her barbecues. And before my mom finally deleted the street from her next door, it seems that the rest of the street had voted to hold an election for a new HOA president. Her tenure lasted six months. Gladys doesn't understand why people talk so fondly about my parents as the most ideal HOA presidents, since they never did a thing. My mom is two years into her new home and does not miss the neighborhood anymore at all. Edit. Okay, so everyone is super mad at my mom for ruining many lives like Syndrome from The Incredibles. Let me explain how the handoff slash nomination went. Holy crap, Secret Garden. The moving truck is coming in one hour and we still haven't cleaned out all the shelves in this study. What do we do? Just start throwing SH in boxes, mom. And here's a trash bag for old cords and papers. Oh my word, your father's old HOA binder. Toss it. Nah, we can't. I think this is supposed to be kept by the city or something. Mom, we don't have time. We can mail it to the city or something. Hun, run it over to Gladys. Mom, are you sure? She's always been bugging me about it. She can keep it. Now run. I then literally tear downstairs, race across the street, ring the doorbell, shove the binder into Gladys's hands with a my mom says this is yours now, bye, and race back to find out the Christmas decorations were still in a forgotten cabinet and need to be thrown into a trash bag. Literally zero premeditation and 100% aggravated meltdowns about moving. I cannot stress how much my mom did not want to move. My dad built her that house. The first night in the new house, she, a 58-year-old woman, cried until 4 a.m. begging to go home. She loved our neighborhood, our street, and our house. She did not try to ruin her neighbors' lives. We didn't know anyone left on the street by that point anyway. They'd all been priced out and moved too except Gladys. The end line is kind of a throwaway saying my mom is doing much better now, and she doesn't miss Gladys at all. I do feel bad for all those folks driven out by Gladys' dumb rules, but I'm also going to say the high property taxes probably didn't help. If I ever won the lottery, the first thing I would do would be buy our house back, put it in trust, and let my mom live there for the rest of her life. Anyways, to the commenter saying my dad was an effing legend, he absolutely was. The second story is... Shut the store down to cover your A? You got it, dude. Okay, another one that's not my MC, but something I witnessed and was affected by. This was back in 2009. I was working in a small town at a Mexican-inspired American fast food restaurant named after a food item and a musical instrument. Decent job, mostly good people. I'd been there almost two years when this event happened. There's a small cast of characters here. Ursine, me, Sarah, shift manager, Jane, underage co-worker, Billy, new assistant manager. When our previous assistant manager left, Sarah was convinced she was getting promoted, but instead they brought in Billy. Sarah was peeved as hell and hated Billy on sight. Now I didn't think he was all that bad at first, but he quickly revealed one massive glaring flaw. He, a mid-twenties male, soon started flirting with and then dating Jane, who was just 16 at the time. Creepy and wrong and her parents did not like it. So one day Sarah and myself were working together, doing a 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. closing shift. Around 9 p.m. we get a call from Billy telling us to shut down the store immediately. Naturally, Sarah wanted to know why. Billy just told us to close and that we were not to let anyone in no matter what. Of course, this sounded all wrong to us and Sarah should have refused to at least call the general manager to ask him if we could close up. But technically, Billy did have the authority to shut down the store. So we, as should be obvious, complied. We locked the doors, did all the closing stuff and shut down before 10. 
Sarah even adjusted my clock out so I got paid for my full schedule. I was off the next two days, so I didn't discover the fallout until I came back. It turns out that Billy had taken Jane to a party, which would have been bad enough, but the worst part was that the party was across state lines, and Jane had told her parents that she was working. So Jane got a message from someone that her parents were going to the store to check up on her, hence Billy wanting us to close before they got there. Jane's parents forced her to tell them the truth when she got home, and contacted our general manager to tell him what happened. Billy got fired and was lucky to not be arrested. Jane was restricted to school, work, and home for the rest of the year, and Sarah still did not get promoted to assistant manager. They brought in yet another manager from a different store. Meanwhile, I kept doing my job. Edit. Technically, them just dating was not illegal, until they crossed state lines against her parents' wishes. Really creepy and wrong, but not illegal. And I don't think the general manager knew until Jane's parents told him they were dating. But yeah, he should have been arrested. It's a federal kidnapping charge, actually. But as far as I know, Billy never took Jane over state lines until that night. And her parents apparently threatened but did not actually call the police on him. I don't know why. The last story is... Only do accounting work during your two weeks notice. After working at a toxic office job for a few years, I decided it was time for me to leave. I gave my a bit more than two week notice and started to organize my myriad of tasks to hand off. I was an accounts payable assistant and the company had created my position and added various tasks with other departments over the years. I helped with accounting, inventory, audits, customer service, marketing, sales, and events. My primary manager, we'll call her Barb, was the accounting manager, and there was always a struggle because she assigned the extra work to me, but then refused to acknowledge that I did jobs for other departments than hers. She was the primary reason for me leaving. Every day I ask her if we can have a meeting to discuss my different tasks, how I've organized them, and how to complete them as no one does these tasks in the company but me. She refuses to meet with me and reminds me to keep up with deadlines. No problem. For the next two weeks, Barb doesn't remove a single task from my plate. She refuses to meet with me for any reason, and consistently sends condescending emails about the lack of work effort she's seeing from me. I don't have the emails saved anymore, but they all included the same message. I'm the boss, just do your job. I brought this to the owner's attention since I work closely with her, about how I felt like there was no bridge to the next person in my position. I was told Barb runs the accounting department so do what she says. Yes ma'am. I showed up every day and worked as if I wasn't leaving. Other managers asked me who was taking over tasks I handled for them. I referred them to Barb, who told them she handled accounting, not their departments, and to stop wasting her time. She then told me to only work on accounting related tasks, as that was position regardless of the last few years of my tasks being spread across the company. I got this in writing and printed a few copies to cover myself. On my last day, Barb called me in her office and scolded me for ignoring 75% of my duties. Specifically, inventory was due that day and I hadn't begun it. I reminded her of her accounting work only demand, which she claimed she wasn't referring to inventory to. She told me to compile a list of all the non-accounting jobs I handled, to which I was prepared with a list. Many of these had deadlines missed or coming soon but I had ignored per her instructions. I was told that if I didn't meet my deadlines for the week, she would not give me a good reference. She also told me to stay as late as I needed to finish up. I didn't need her reference and I wasn't staying late on my last day. I forwarded the email of her telling me to not complete any other jobs to the owner, along with the list of missed or closed deadlines that wouldn't be met now. Then I clocked out and left and never returned. This was years ago, and from what I've heard, she still runs the accounting department for them. I was the one blamed for tasks not being complete. Oh well. Subscribe, click the like button if you want to support the channel. Thank you for watching.